All right, in this video, we're going to talk about the 512 keyboard and specifically in the keyboard mode. In later videos, we will talk about the arpeggiator sequencer and the ability for the 512 to do MIDI to CV and MIDI to MIDI conversion. So the first thing you do, or you're going to want to do when you get the 512 is decide on whether you're going to control a MIDI synthesizer or an analog CV gate synthesizer. The 512 can control both at the same time. In our setup here, we've got the Excess, which is both MIDI and CV gate. It's an analog synthesizer, monophonic. And we've also got a Virus B, which is just MIDI, but it is multi-timbral and polyphonic. So we're going to use it to demonstrate some of the polyphonic features of the uh, 512 keyboard here. So in our setup, we're taking the MIDI out, routing it into the MIDI in of the excess, taking the MIDI through of the excess, and routing it onto the MIDI in of the virus B. We've also got the gate output here of the 512 going into the gate in of the excess, the key CV out going into the CV in, and the touch control of the 512 going into the filter modulation of the excess. And in the excess, we were selected uh, the external CV to control the pitch of our oscillators. If we go ahead and turn up uh, mixer here. And I also want to talk about um, powering the unit on. So when you get the unit, you got it all hooked up. And you go to turn it on. Go ahead and switch the unit on. And then you'll see these lights light up. And they'll stay on for just a little bit, and then they'll go off. During that time, you want to avoid touching the keys of the keyboard. The unit is calibrating the capacitive touch keys at that time. And should you be touching one, key may not calibrate correctly. And if that is the case, just go ahead and switch the unit off and back on, and the unit should recalibrate itself correctly. And while you see those LEDs light up, the unit is actually pulling in data from the EEPROM and loading it into the processor, all your presets, all your uh, recorded pattern content for the arpeggiators and sequencers, any scales that you've saved, and any chords that you've saved as well, as any um, preferences that you've done setting the unit up. So let's talk about just an overview of the keyboard here. You'll see we've got 29 full-size keys. They are slightly shorter than your typical keys. Very nice for just a full-sized hand, easy to use. On the left-hand side here, we've got a mod touch wheel, and we've got a positive and negative uh, bend touch pads. All this information is sent out via MIDI and CV gate at the same time. Your analog output you've got here, you've got a clock output, gate output, key CV, you've got velocity, you've got touch or after touch, and mod or mod wheel. The bend information is combined in with the key CV. Over here you've got a glide time control. This is an auto glide type of circuit, which means that if you're playing notes individually, You'll get uh, instantaneous jumps from one pitch to the other over the CV output. If you're holding one key and play additional keys, then the auto glide circuit will kick in and you will begin to glide or slew your pitches from one note to the other. Here you've got your swing control. A swing will affect the timing of notes when you're in the arpeggiator mode. Also when you're playing the sequencer. And it will also affect the analog clock output here. And just to the right of the swing control, actually I should also describe, you've got a 50% swing to 75% swing amount. Here's your tempo control just to the right of the swing control. And your tempo will vary from 20 beats per minute all the way up to 250 beats per minute. Right about in the middle setting here, you're about 115 uh, beats per minute, just so you know. Here are your mode switches. You've got MIDI. You've got your octave uh, up and down keys. You've got your range, direction, transpose, hold, arpeggiator, sequencer, play, and scale key. 
right here is your record LED. Anytime you're doing an uh, editing operation of recording scales, chords, arpeggiator patterns, or sequencer patterns, that LED will come on to indicate that you're in record mode. And uh, some of these keys have multiple functions, so depending on what mode you're doing, you'll see like the text underneath here that calls out different functions. These are primarily when you're writing sequences. And also it's important to point out that this octave section with the LEDs above it, these LEDs are really used to help display a lot of different information while we're making edits to parameters. So let's go ahead and just play the keyboard. Here we are controlling the excess that you're hearing. If we want to use mod wheel, we've got to dial up the mod wheel. We can affect the cutoff frequency of the filter. Let's give it a little more. Or we could say mod wheel controls the LFO amount to the filter. And we can apply pitch bend. If we want to apply some velocity, we'd have to turn up the velocity amount in the filter, say to control how much the envelope is affecting the filter cutoff. So as we play notes softer or with less pad area of our finger, we're going to create a softer velocity. And as we play harder and faster with more of our pad, or the pad of our finger, we're going to generate higher velocities. And velocities for the keyboard can be set up. There are five velocity curves. We have linear, an S shape, and a couple logarithmic shapes there. To edit those, you hold the MIDI key down, select the shape that you'd like, and those are shown in the manual. And once you select a shape, the LEDs above the octave key will show you the range that you'll be affecting. So as you decrease this range, uh, you will only be varying the loudest velocity settings. Now it doesn't matter. It matters less how hard we hit the key we're not going to get those soft notes that we were getting earlier. Now let's engage the aftertouch. We've got it routed to our filter input, so if we go and select external here and turn up that amount, we can play a key. And as we vary the touch of our finger on the pad, we are increasing that control voltage. And like velocity curves, we also have aftertouch curves. These five keys, while we're holding the MIDI key, will allow us to select either a linear, an S shape, or several exponential curves. I personally, if you're, okay, there's two methods I like to approach this. You can select a linear uh, shape and go ahead and increase the range. What that's gonna do is give you varying pressure over the entire range of touching the key. So as soon as you touch it, after touch is going to engage and then vary throughout the entire touch range. If we go to one of the more exponential and raise our range, we can play notes soft, very hard, and we're still not activating that after touch until we have it. It takes a lot greater pressure or pad coverage on the on the key to activate aftertouch. So you can use that to really dial in the settings of the keyboard for your personal preference. If you like to work more like a traditional keyboard, or if you want full range of touch control over the entire touch sense. While we're in the MIDI mode, let's go ahead and describe what these other keys do. The first 16 major keys here, labeled 1 through 16 on the palm rest, 
Those select our MIDI channel. All you do is just press a key and to demonstrate that I'm going to turn up the virus since it's responding to different channels. That was channel 6. If we want to play channel 1, just hold MIDI key, press channel 1. Channel 2. Let's go back to 6. And again there you can hear the LFO modulation coming in when the aftertouch is engaged. And we could play chords. Also, we've got the octave here that we could select a different octave. Or we could apply a pitch bend. So you can control both your MIDI and your CV gates in similar ways there. Also in the MIDI page here, let's say for instance you're controlling a MIDI synthesizer that does not respond to aftertouch. You can hit the top major key and when you do that you'll notice this LED here goes off and on. And the way I like to remember it as aftertouch is it's an upward arrow, kind of looks like an A, also looks like an arrow pointing out. So when that light is on, we are sending aftertouch out over MIDI. When it's off, um, we will stop transmission over MIDI, but you will still have the CV output over control voltage and gate to control your analog synthesizers. And in addition, we also have these two keys. These two keys define the bend range for the touchpads. Here we have the full range, which is typically a two semitone positive and negative bend range. It's just default for most keyboards. I know the excess is that way and a lot of others are that way. And we thought it'd be nice to be able to limit that range to a single semitone. So when you hold MIDI and select this first minor key here, now your bend range is half of what it normally would be. So if we play a note, There we're just getting a uh, single semitone bend. Where that will come in useful is as you start to apply scales later on. Let's say you've applied, you're using the major scale and uh, you're playing through those notes and you just want to bend a note sharp or flat by a semitone. You can select the half range bend range and that'll come in really useful for that. Hitting notes that are kind of outside the typical scale that we're using. Uh, let's see. The other thing you'll notice is this keyboard is very fast. I mean you don't have to lift your finger even off the keyboard to play notes. And same with chords. You can And you can alter the spacing of notes for your chords too while you're dragging notes. Very hard to do with a traditional mechanical keyboard. And let's listen to what it does to the excess here. Bring this up, turn our velocity down, and select a bandpass filter. And you'll notice that if we play individual keys with a light touch, we're getting re-triggering of the envelope here. But since the autoglide function engages whenever we play more than one key, if you move your hand just slightly, 
sideways while you drag. You will activate the auto glide function which allows you to slew notes uh, with just one finger as you drag it up and down the keyboard versus let's turn these down a little bit so it's very fast to play a lot of interesting things that you can do here also since it is uh, monophonic and we can play polyphonic notes it's sometimes interesting to get very rapid notes by holding kind of a chord and dragging that along. Let's increase it those times. for the cutoff. Increase our amount. Let's talk about some of the more interesting features of the 512. And the first thing I'd like to touch on is scales. Here's the scale key here. When you hold it, you have access to 29 different scales assigned to the keys of the keyboard. Uh, this very uppermost Major key selects the chromatic scale. All the other uh, 28 keys of the keyboard, those are 28 locations where you can write your own user scales to. To select a scale, just hold the scale key and press a key representing the location for the scale. And now you'll notice we have a very wide range assigned to the keyboard now. I've basically selected the major uh, key scale, and you'll notice as I play up and down the keys. It's playing a major scale, but it's using all the keys of the keyboard. We call that full scale mapping of the scale. And you'll notice when you hold down the scale key, these LEDs light up. When all of them are on, that indicates you've got full scale mapping. If you press the negative octave key, the LEDs change to a light pattern that's similar to the major keys uh, pattern. And that indicates that you are now in a partial mapping or scale mapping mode, which assigns new pitches of the scale only to the major keys of the keyboard. So the major keys are only playing the major scale. And as we play up into the minor keys, You'll notice they play the same pitch that previously followed them on the major keys. So that way you can still play the minor keys. But it's forcing those keys into the scale uh, keys, or the pitches of the scale, I should say. There is one other thing I'd like to show you here, and that is when you hold the scale key, you can determine the direction of the scale by holding the direction key. And now the LEDs, all the positive LED uh, lights light up, indicating the, uh, the scale is assigned in, a, in an ascending or typical way. If we hold the scale and direction key and hit the negative key, the negative LEDs will all light up, and now, instead of sending up the keyboard, our entire keyboard has been flipped upside down. And that's useful uh, when you are playing the arpeggiator or the sequencer, uh, because it will affect the notes that those uh, sequencers and arpeggiators are playing at that time by flipping the notes upside down. Let's go ahead and select the pentatonic scale here. And now I'm going to show you how you can write your own scale. So once your scale is selected, hold the scale key and press the play key. You'll notice the record LED comes on and now we are ready to record our scale. At this point, the keyboard turns back into a chromatic 
keyboard uh, pitches and uh, we are ready to enter the pitches in in any order. Let's say for instance we would like to write a major scale to the keyboard. We would just need to press the keys for that scale. So and exit and now let's see what we have on the keyboard. And you'll notice that even though we only entered in seven notes, uh, the remainder of the keys for the keyboard have now been automatically filled in with higher transpositions of uh, our scale in the various higher octaves. What is unique about the 512 scales is that you can write the order of pitches in any order you like, and you can write up to 29 different pitches. Um, so basically you can assign any pitch to any key of the keyboard. But let's, uh, let's try something a little different here. Let's take the same scale. And again, we're going to enter record mode. And now instead of writing a scale, we're going to write a little melody into our scale location. So I'm going to just play something. exit that scale mode and I am going to select the partial scale mode for mapping which means those notes I played are just going to be assigned to the major keys of the keyboard so now if I drag my finger along the keyboard you'll hear the same melody I played or if I drag it backwards you'll hear that melody played backwards So now we can play a melody simply by dragging our finger across the keyboard. And in addition to that, we could jump around and play various notes of that melody in new orders. And the other interesting thing about this is we can use this scale and apply it to our arpeggiators or sequencer patterns or when we're doing MIDI to CB and MIDI to MIDI conversion. And in a way that's going to remix uh, the notes of the traditional keyboard into some new pattern. So it's a lot of fun to play with that. And just for instance, look how fast we can play this pattern. Or try stepping through the pattern in a new way. Another trick you could use this for is let's say that uh, you're doing some sort of performance or you're controlling some other instrument that has uh, voices mapped out along the keyboard whether it's a drum machine or a sampler and you just want um, to place the sounds as they're going to happen in order you could do that as well. So a lot of different uses you think of what you can apply it to we're sure you can come up with some really interesting results. Also with scales, let's go back in here and again we'll select the same scale we've been writing to, enter the scale mode, and we can uh, we could write very simple scales. Um, we could write notes backwards. Let's try writing uh, some pitches backwards. So now our scale is going to sound like this. So lots of different ways you can use scales to apply to your music to really transform it and uh, come up with some new playing techniques. Now let's take a look at the hold mode. While we're in the keyboard mode, let's go ahead and play some notes. And now if we activate the hold function, let go of the keys, 
you'll notice those notes continue to sustain. At this point, we can add more notes to our sustain. And those notes again will continue to sustain until we release the hold mode. The hold mode also stores our preset and user writable chords. You'll notice right now, when we play a note on the keyboard, we're just hearing one individual tone, but by holding the hold key and pressing any of the 29 keyboard keys, we can select the preset or user writable chords. For instance, let's select this one, let go. Let's select a different one. Those are two note chords. Let's go ahead and try a three note chord here. Now the unique thing about the 512 compared to older synthesizers that had some sort of chord hold mode is that um, the 512 allows you to play up to six notes in a chord and then play up to 16 different transpositions of that chord. And there you're only limited by the amount of polyphony and multi-timbral voices that your MIDI sound module you're controlling provides. Now let's take a look at how we would enter in our own chords. First, go ahead and select a chord you'd like to write to. And I'm going to select this one. And then enter the chord record mode by holding the hold key and pressing the play key. At this point, we are ready to enter in up to six notes, and we could press them in one at a time. We could slam our hands down or uh, whatever we like, although I will point out it makes a lot of sense later on, you'll find out, to play the notes from low to high. You want to play your root note first, then all higher pitches following it for traditional type chords. That's not to say you can't start with the high note and then play notes lower or play notes in any order you like. It's just to get traditional results with the um, chord inversion function, which we'll talk about in a little bit, you want to write the notes of the chord in an order that we know. Okay, so I just wrote five notes. I'm going to exit the chord mode. And now let's try that. And as I was saying earlier, uh, the 512 also has chord inversion. So there's the chord uninverted. If we hold the hold key and press the octave key, that's now inverting the root note up an octave. Let's try another inversion. And another. So there we're applying positive inversion to the chord. Let's go back to our zero value. Play the original. And while that's harder to do while you're playing the keyboard live, it can be really useful when you are arpeggiating or playing the sequencer. And you'll notice that when we play the notes back on the keyboard like this, since we played this note, this note, this note, this note, it's now like we're playing this note, this note, this note, this note. So the notes of our chord, we've got a root note on the note that we're playing, and the additional notes of the chord are extending up in the positive direction. Let's listen to that again. As an alternative, let's try writing to a different chord location, and this time we're going to play that same pattern but dis descending from the root note. So get out of record mode. 
So that's what it sounds like based on a root note when we enter notes in a descending order. Let's play it in the ascending order. And let's see what happens now that we're in this descending order when we do positive chord inversion. Let's try a different alternative. Let's go ahead and select a third chord and go into record mode. And this time we're going to play notes like this. And now, let's see where that chord is based on this root note. So there you can see how important it is when you are entering in the notes of a chord uh, to really pay special attention to the order in which notes are entered because you are going to get different results. There are three main transposition features in the 512. First we have linear transposition. To activate that, go ahead and press the transpose key. You'll see the LED light up. And now mapped across our keyboard, we can transpose uh, the keyboard. We could also transpose the arpeggiator or sequencer. This middle C key is our zero value. If we press that, the keyboard is playing as you would expect it to. If we were to hit low C, we will now transpose the entire keyboard down by 12 semitones, or we can transpose the keyboard up to plus 16 semitones by pressing the upper key. Let's say your transposition value is set to minus three semitones and then exit the transpose mode. You're gonna notice that the transpose key LED is gonna blink, indicating that we are no longer at the zero transposition value. Let's go back into the transpose value and select middle C, we'll exit, and you'll notice that LED is off. So anytime you're editing the linear transposition value, that LED is going to be on and solid. If you have a value assigned to it other than zero, it'll blink just to remind you when you're not editing transpose that you're at some other value than zero. Let's go ahead and enter. We're going to clear out our transposition. Now let's listen to the keyboard. Now let's transpose down by three. Let's transpose down some more. So that transposition method is what you would typically think of in when some other keyboard calls out transposition. You also have the octave transposition, allowing you to access nine different octaves of this keyboard span range. So. And notice you can change that octave on, on the fly. Let's say, for instance, if you're holding a chord, you could select a different octave and play notes in that chord. You could let up on a key. Select a different octave. So you can change octaves on the fly as well. Now let's talk about scalar transposition. So we've got a scale here assigned as the major key scale across the keyboard. So if we hold down the transpose key, we can now select any of the 29 keys. Notice that key number one, or the low C key, is a value of zero. Then we go plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, and so on, all the way up the keyboard. So again, let's listen to our 
keyboard. That's with zero scalar transposition. I'm going to go down an octave. Now let's transpose up one, two, three. So what this scalar transposition is doing is it's moving all the notes of the scale up one to the next note of the scale. So when you do scalar transpositions, you're moving the notes to a different range, but all the notes remain within the scale that you've got selected. Where linear transposition, your major keys may transpose into a minor key and vice versa. Um, so scalar transposition is very musical and uh, not a lot of keyboards offer that. So give that a try. Uh, scalar transposition and and be sure to apply it when you're doing arpeggiations and sequences you can also apply it when you're doing MIDI to MIDI and MIDI to CV conversion so a lot of different ways you can use that the range and the direction keys uh, they have no effect on the keyboard itself um, those are things that apply to the arpeggiator and the sequencer I've already talked about the octave here and MIDI Basically, MIDI is our setup here. Again, I believe I've already discussed this. This turns aftertouch off and on. Here we've got our MIDI channels. Here we've got our pitch bend, our velocity, uh, and aftertouch curves and ranges. But also, when we hold the MIDI key, if we hold it by itself and use the octave up down keys, you're going to see these LEDs change. And that gets us into the various different modes. When the first three LEDs are completely off, we're just in an internal mode operating the keyboard. Our first mode here is sync, which allows any internal clock operations like operation of the arpeggiator or sequencer to sync up to an external sequencer or clock. Next mode is CV mode. We'll be taking uh, MIDI coming in and converting it to CV out in that mode. Here we've got sync and CV, which means that not only will we, will we be converting external MIDI into CV and gate, but we can take external clock and synchronize that and produce our analog clock as well. We've got poly mode. A poly mode is pretty interesting. Let's let's talk about this. Alright, so our MIDI channel, we're going to select channel 1 and we're controlling the virus here. So I'm just playing individual notes and all those are going out on the MIDI channel I've selected. If I select channel 2, if I play more than one note at a time, it's going to start intelligently redirecting notes out the next consecutive MIDI channel that we have. Let's say you're playing three notes and you let up on the second one. You can play that second voice now if we let up on the first voice be a lot of fun when you are, let's say you've got an orchestral arrangement laid out across your keyboard, or, um, you know, various instruments assigned for the orchestra throughout the different MIDI channels. Try it, it's a lot of fun. Its original intended purpose is so that you can control up to 16 monophonic uh, synthesizers. They do need to be MIDI. That way, like for instance, we've got our excess here. You could play up to 16 of those polyphonically. Obviously, you don't have to uh, have 16 if you have three. And you play three notes. Those three notes will go out to the available units. If a fourth unit isn't there and a fourth key plays, you simply don't hear that note. And again, you get velocity, aftertouch, mod wheel, and pitch bend 
on all playing voices that you are using. And even when you re release those keys, the 512 is smart enough to know the last channels that you were using so you can continue to use pitch bend and mod wheel or add aftertouch as well. Let's also look at, let's go in here and assign a chord. And you'll notice there that uh, when we are in this poly mode here and in the keyboard and assign a chord to it, that's a three note chord. So it's each individual MIDI channel is playing three different notes. Yet if we play a second note, it's telling our second voice to play those three notes at whatever transposition level. So a lot of different ways you can approach that. Um, keep in mind though, when you go into like the arpeggiator and the sequencer, since we know that only one note is going to be playing at any time by either the arpeggiator or sequencer, this poly mode handles the reaction of chord selection a little bit different. Since we know only one note is going to be happening at any time, what happens is each note of that chord is then spit out on a different MIDI channel. So that can be a lot of fun too, and it's a different way you can use poly mode. So give each one a try and have a lot of fun. On to the modes here. So beyond poly, we've got poly sync. Poly sync, uh, I believe that just allows you to synchronize the arpeggiator and sequencer when you're doing that special poly conversion because since the arpeggiator and the sequencer is just playing an individual note at any time, should you apply a chord of multiple notes to play for that individual note that's in the arpeggiator or sequencer, what it will do is take those up to six notes of the chord and intelligently spit those out a different MIDI channel. So now you can play your chords in here that are being auto-generated based on the arpeggiator or sequencer and allow you to control up to say six different modules or six different voices in your external synthesizers. Here you've got CV poly mode. What that's going to do is it's going to bring external MIDI in here and translate it into other MIDI information that is intelligently redirecting the MIDI channel. So as just as we are playing the keyboard here polyphonically, if we hooked up another keyboard that's MIDI or a sequencer that's got some polyphonic notes playing in it, it will then redirect that information out to your different MIDI sound modules. And at the same time you're doing that, if your sequencer does not um, produce like aftertouch or mod wheel or pitch bend, you can add that information to it by playing the front panel here. And you can also force those notes to a scale. You can transpose those notes coming into anything. You can uh, do scalar transposition as well or you can even assign chords to individual notes. Lots of fun and lots of things to discover there. And finally you've got poly CV or sync CV poly. Let's see, I, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> there are so many features of this keyboard that you're, you're just going to have to refer to the manual in some aspects. There's just too many possibilities for me to remember everything off the top of my head.
All right, so that pretty much sums up just the keyboard. There's just so much to try. I just recommend you get it, plug it into what you've got, experiment, and have a lot of fun trying out all these features.